we joined now by Judge Johan Krichler, Chair of Freedom Under Law, to help us unpack the fundamental rights enshrined in the Constitution of South Africa, and whether or not it's living up to it in its uh, transition or transformative agenda. Very good evening to you, and thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us, uh, uh, Justice Krichler. Perhaps I should start with whether our constitution in South Africa is still apt and relevant to, uh, as I said, the transformative agenda that we've embarked on. Well, good evening to you and good evening to the listeners. Of course, the constitution is as relevant as it ever has been. In fact, it's probably more relevant now that we face the challenges in the aftermath of the COVID pandemic and the onslaught, the undermining of our rights, our hopes, our aspirations by the corruption to which President Ramaphosa referred in his speech today. The Constitution guarantees only to the extent that we make it work as a guarantee. It is a document it doesn't have a life of its own. We must give it the life. And that is what makes it so relevant mm. because the Constitution was a bridge document, a hope document, a document looking to the future and binding all of us to concentrate our energies and our efforts towards an objective in the future. It remains relevant. Mm. And, and just on that point of view, I mean, it was set to be a peace treaty uh, that was uh, seeking to unite South Africans uh, in ameliorating some of the past harms. But, uh, and, and this is what I want to understand from you on how we assess its performance and uh, significance today, because what would have been regarded as an enemy back then has changed because I think many South Africans uh, are shocked at levels of corruption that we're seeing, the rising levels of uh, poverty. So with that in mind, the design of uh, the Constitution itself, uh, talk to us about how we assess its performance. You know, I think we must see our constitution in its context. We, it didn't descend upon us from Mars or from the sun. It was a document that was evolved in the course of a prolonged, sensible, dedicated negotiation process in order to recognize all of the injustices of the past, including the terrible horror of Sharpville that we are commemorating today. <laughs> but a document is not magic. And we said we will work together for the future. We promised that, but we hadn't done that yet. We are obliged every day, every week, every year to continue to try to make relevant, to make real what the Constitution envisaged. Uh, please, I, I want to make it plain, as plain as I can. The Constitution is not magic. The magic is in our hands. We can either make it work or we can't. We've overcome terrible challenges in the past. We saw the AIDS challenge, enormous challenge. We saw the pandemic of COVID. We've survived that. We've survived what would have been a bloody civil war. We negotiated through that. We in South Africa can do many things, but it is us, we, who've got to do them. The Constitution at the moment is under challenge. It will always be under some challenge or another. The challenge at the moment is that for a number of reasons, corruption has taken hold of the vitals of our country. And that's the problem with corruption, is that it eats from the inside. It undermines 
from the inside of the of the fortress. It's not an enemy outside, it's an enemy within. And we must see to it now that we fight that enemy that is within our ranks. So we can do so. These are available. How do we do that using the Constitution? And by this, when I say we, I mean every single member of society, because the whole thing about achieving social justice was to create institutions and ensure that we appoint representatives that are going to work on behalf of the people and not in a self-serving manner. You know, you underline the most crucial point of South Africa, its civil society. I've worked in many parts of the world. The one thing that distinguishes South Africa from other struggling countries is the strength of our civil society, whether it be the Women's Association of Orlando West or whether it be the Fro Federasi of Petersburg, civil society in South Africa pulled us through the election of 1994 because civil society wanted it to work. Civil society, not only as organized in its political parties, which are very important in civil society, but all of the other structures the local sports clubs, the local women's clubs, the local men's social uh, associations, the cricket players team, the, the, the sports associations, we're all together in this as South Africans who are doing more than just merely living within our own four walls of our own dwelling. We are social beings. We are faith-based beings. We are politically driven beings. We are ideologically conscience-driven people. And there are many, many ways in which civil society acting through you and me, Joan and Chabalala, the equal ones, the simple ones, the humble ones, we are all citizens of this country. We all have rights and we can all say to the leaders, to the political representatives, no, no, you're not doing what I un uh, uh, instructed you to do. I didn't vote for you to do what you're doing now. You, freedom is a, an expensive item that requires eternal vigilance from all of us. We must raise our voices, we must watch critically, we must observe and comment where it is necessary. That is democracy. That's what the Constitution aims at. So for people to know and understand their rights is one thing, but it's also uh, important to have functioning institutions that are well suited for the objectives which we want. So if the society feels that the state in its totality is not living up to that which it promises in the constitution. Um, certainly when we look at the high levels of uh, poverty, uh, high levels of uh, joblessness, there are people who would feel isolated from society, who would feel that their contribution would not make an impact. And unfortunately, and, and I'm going to look at the organs of state, I mean, our own constitutional de uh, design was aimed at ensuring fundamental rights, democratic governance, including independent chapter nine institutions that support democracy, uh, uh, multi-level governance, the security services, all of this working together for the greater good of South Africans. But we have seen some of these institutions weaponized, politicized. How do we overcome that? It is not easy. It's not a job that will be done in one day or one week. It has taken several years for us to get down into the swamp where they are at the moment. It will take a longer time for us to get out of it. But let me start by saying 
there's no division between the state and the people. The people are the state and the state is only the people. We the people are the funda- foundation of the constitution, <laughs> excuse me, of the constitution and of the state that is created by the constitution. We are in charge. If the government doesn't do what we want it to do, we must change the government. If our representatives are not doing the job that they should be doing, it is our responsibility to keep them active and alert. We must not allow our town representatives in our municipalities. We must not allow our provincial representatives, and we must certainly not allow our parliamentary representatives to ignore what we want, to only return to us, to give us sweet stories every five years when they want our votes. We must make sure that we are aware of what they are doing and what they are not doing. It is not them and us. It is all us. If the politicians are not doing what they should be doing, if the government servants are not doing what they should be doing, if the state-owned organizations, if the public utilities are not functioning properly, it is our responsibility and our right and our power to see to it that those who should be doing it do their job properly. I repeat, democracy requires active vigilance by the citizenry, all of them, all the time. Politicians and government servants are human beings. They will also take chances like all of us will do if they are not watched. We see we are now in the what I've said is a swamp of corruption. That is because we looked the other way. We allowed people to do things which we knew they were doing, but we couldn't be bothered We couldn't get off our backsides and stop them doing it. The corruption that was created during the 12 years or 10 years of the previous presidency did not arise at Nkandla. It was all over the country. It was everywhere that it was visible and not only in certain political circles. It's do not be misled into thinking it was only President Zuma or his Indian business associates who were responsible for the corruption that we're in today. I am sure that the Zondo Commission has showed all of us that corruption was widespread from way up in the northwest of the Cape to the east coast of KwaZulu-Natal. It is everywhere at all levels of government. Justice uh, Johan Krichler, thank you so much for your time and insights. Uh, much appreciated. A vigilant uh, and active civil society.